The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to lesson 36 of your distance learning session for Geology Opacic Science with Kenneth Yosimbo. Our lesson 36 is titled Description of Fossils. This time we shall focus on the class Cephalopoda. In our today's lesson, we shall begin by looking at the assignment which we had during our last class. We will find out the outcomes of the lesson, and then look at the previous knowledge, the problem situation, the lesson which shall be exploited through activities, then the summary exercises, and we shall end our lesson with an assignment. During our last class, we had an assignment to do at home, and it required that we should, with the aid of diagram, describe the shell morphology of fossil mytilus. Emphasis in this particular question were to be laid on the diagram, especially the shell structure, which has to uh, show the appearance or the, 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 the morphological features. That, from the diagram, we can be able to describe the fossil mytilus and grasp the features that helps this particular general to fall under this class and the phylum. Now, as answer, that is the first part of the question, which is the diagram. This is the diagram of fossil mytilus. You see the posterior muscle scar, have the bisal gap, and then you have the anterior muscle scar, you have the umbo, and you have the ligament. We look at the structure. It is slimmed and not really straight and does not have a pallia sinus, which means that it has an entire uh, uh, mantle. Therefore, we will have only the pallia line. That helps us to be able to develop its mode of formation. Therefore, the mood of the morphology of fossil mit uh, mitilus has to do with the fact that it is in equilateral, or that the shell is in equilateral, but has an umbo. The posterior end is enlarged and rounded. There are the presence of faint external group uh, lines, or better still, we call them group rings. The dentition is poorly developed or absent or may be found as impression, that is, rudimentary teeth. Then the ligament is opistodetic, meaning that it is found behind the umbo, as we have seen in the diagram. It has an entire pallia line, meaning that it lacks a pallia sinus. The shell is an anisomaria which means that the posterior muscle scar is larger than the anterior muscle scar. They lived on rocks in the littoral zone, meaning that they are attached forms and therefore adopt an attachment mode of life. 
This kind of fossils, especially fossil mytholoids, is common in Jurassic rocks. Jurassic is in the Mesozoic era. Another way of stating the age could have been from Jurassic or from Mesozoic. In our lesson today, we shall uh, uh, be able to describe and identify fossils under the class Cephalopoda based on their shell morphology. Remember that morphological features are those features like we saw during classification that should guide us know the phyla of an organism as well as the class under which the organism or the fossil finds itself. Now previously we had looked at classification of fossils and we learned that geologists basically classify fossils on their morphological and ecological aspects. For that reason, we also are able to state the different groups that are commonly fossilized or are commonly preserved as uh, fossils, six of which we already mentioned. The fact that we have the phylum mollusca, the phylum uh, um, brachiopoda, echinodermata, uh, selenterat or selenterata, and then codata. So those are the commonly fossilized, the ones that we shall be seeing through. Now, in our problem situation, a petroleum engineer visits the Bakasi Peninsula in southwest Cameroon. He collected samples and realized that, the, that he could use them to determine when past geologic events occurred. He further noticed that many organisms have lived in the area, but all fossils are not representing the past life. Now, he also collected many traces of, or many types of fossil shells, and noticed that fossil traces differ greatly. Now, our concern or our worry is how did he notice the many types of fossil shells and the differing nature of fossil traces. That is our worry. And our responses will be geared towards us discovering which criteria the petroleum engineer used in order to discover the fossil traces as well as the different types of fossil shells. Now, possibly he might have used the effect of denudational agents on the fossils. That is a possibility. He might have applied the idea of gaps in fossil records. That is another possibility. And he might have used the morphological and ecological aspects of the fossils. Those are all possibilities that are geologically oriented. As we go through our lesson, we will see which of them best suits our concern or our ability to discover which method or which steps the petroleum engineer used in the field to come out with different types of fossil shells as well as the different organic traces. Now you take a look at this diagram. As you observe the photo, you shall deduce what you see. You shall take note of the impression and the way it appears. You look at this, look at this portion, and know that it is occurring within a rock mass. Now, this guides us to our lesson of today, which is on class Cephalopoda. The second class under the phylum uh, Biravia or phylum Mollusca is the class Cephalopoda. This class is subdivided into, into three. You have the Natuloide, that is fossil that train from the Upper Cambrian to recent. Remember, recent we made the Cenozoic. Then the Ammonida, 
which are fossils that range from Devonian to Cretaceous. And then we have the Choroide or Belim Belimnoida, which are fossils that range from Upper Carboniferous to Eocene. We begin with the first subclass, that is the subclass Natinoida. This class is the only uh, subclass that represents the living forms, generally called Natulus, which is a common example. Now you look at this morphological uh, form of the fossil Natulus. If you look at it, you see the body, the jaws, the tentacles, the chamber, the septum, the siphuncle, and then you have the older and the living part of the shell, then you have gills. This is a clear indication of a fossil drawing that shows all the parts, both hard parts and soft parts. Now we also have this other diagram that shows the external view of the fossil nautilus. Here we have a re which is a depression that helps to balance the organism. Then we have the body chamber and we have the buoyancy center. Then we have the umbilicus. Now, the shell description indicates septa, which are chambered divisions. We have the foramen, which are central perforations on each septum. Remember that septa is the plural, while septum is the singular. The septa neck also we have, which, is a, which are short tubes around the siphuncle. Now, when we look at the shell form, we realize that the, the fossil natulus or natloiders will have an aragonetic shell with two layers. Now, this shell is arag aragonetic in composition, meaning that it is rich in calcium carbonate, but it is unstable. Then, they have a single form shell, which is colonial. Then, the shell is also straight in some and helps and is described as the autocon. Then the, the coiling nature of the shell is planospira. Then they have one complete coil which is called the wool. Also, they are partitioned into involute and evolute. The involute shells are those with several walls. Why the evolute shells are those with, without walls or with few walls? Then there is a depression between earlier form wall, uh, womb and the last womb forms, which uh, forms the umbilicus. In other words, the umbilicus is situated or located between the earlier form womb and the last form womb of the shell. Then. They are loosely coiled, or the shells are loosely coiled, and once they are loosely coiled, we call them evolute shells. And then, when they are tightly coiled, we call them involute shells. So the direct difference between evolute shells and involute shells is the fact that the evolute shells have small umbilicals, while the, 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 the tightly coiled, or the involute, may have a large or better still, a small umbilicus, where the clear distinction is based on the coiling nature. Either it is loosely coiled and it is evolute, or it is tightly coiled and it is involute. You have to take note of these terms because we shall be using them to describe the different fossil genera. The chamber part of the shell has the phragmacum, that is a gaseous increasing a, 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 a part of the shell that has gases which increases buoyancy or that form the center of buoyancy. Then we have situ lines which form traces on edges of the center. Now that helps us to be able to now bring a clear distinction Based on the morphological features, we are going to 
continue by looking at the sheer morphology of natuloids. And the first is natulus. Natulus has a shell which is made up of few walls. And the shell has a planospiral coiling, or a planospiral coiling, with a small umbilicus. Now, the aperture is over, and with a deep dosal reentrant, which helps to bring a balance. Then we have a septa which is concave forward. Now, there, there, are, there is a gently folded suture uh, line, or the suture lines are gently folded with a central foramen. Then, one other specific property is the element of the septal neck, which is projected backward. This gives a retro siphon, uh, uh, siphoncle, that is, that assists the organism for better feeding. Then, this kind of organisms adopts a pelagic mode of life and they are commonly found or they occur in Oligocene rocks. The second is the Otoceras. The Otoceras have a straight autocon and then the adult forms are cylindrical, which means that the younger forms may not be cylindrical. They may be long or elongated. Then they have a concave septa with a centralized foramen. They are equally pelagic, meaning they adopt a pelagic mode of life, either a life that has to do with borrowing. And then they are commonly found in middle or they were fossilized and preserved in Ordovician rocks or in the middle Ordovician rocks. This is a shell form of Otoceras. You look at the septa neck. It's an isolation from, from here, where you have at the middle position uh, the foramen. You can have the, hypoton uh, the hypotonum or the hypotonomic sinus, which is very, very, very shallow. Then you have the shell when it is removed. They have suture lines and then you have the protoconch. The second part or the second subclass is the class Ammonoida or Ammonoida. The class Ammonoida is further separated into three or is subdivided into three based on the suture lines. Therefore we have the goniatites which are polozoic we have the ceratites that are permo-triassic. We have the ammonites that are mesozoic. The morphology of ammonites. The ammonites mostly have aragonitic shells and they contain archicite, which is made up, uh, which makes up the callus. Then they have a plano spiral kind of coiling in that shell. Then they show evolute an evolute coiling. There are other forms that will show evolute and others that will show involute. There is none of them that should show evolute and involute at the same time. Remember that these are general, uh, 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 general characteristics. Then they have a complete coil which ends up with a wool. Then they have an oval triangular or a depressed section and they contain a ray in trunk on their dosal side. We shall now proceed to look at the different or the three main parts of a mature ammonoid or the basic types or parts of matured ammonites. The first part is the protoconch. The protoconch is the first form part of the shell, then followed by the phragmocon. The phragmocon is the second section and is divided into chambers by septa folded where they meet the shear wall. And then they are either having a zigzag, they either have zigzag lines in their suture lines. And on the basis of their suture lines, we now can further reclass 
the, uh, this particular group of fossils based on their second section, which is the phragmocone. On that basis, we have gonatitic suture lines. That is, suture lines curved into semicircular, that is, entire saddles and uh, sharply jointed loops. The abbreviation S and L will be used with S standing for saddles and L standing for loops. These particular gonatitic suture lines occur in forms that are palozoic in age. That is how it appears. This is a isolated structure drawn. That is how it occurs directly on the fossil shell. Next is the serratitic suture lines, which have semicircular uh, saddles. And then they have a zigzag or crenulated loops. These ones are pemotriasic. That is how they appear. Isolated and in the fossil shell, that is how they appear. The next is the ammonitic suture lines. The ammonitic suture lines are both, they have both zigzag or crenulated saddles and loops. They occur mostly in Mesozoic rocks. This is how they appear on the shell. Now we have the third part of the section, which is the body chamber. This is the last section or the third section of the shell, which is which contains a last chamber made up of uh, that makes up the body of the organism. The shell opens at the aperture, and the aptitude that makes up two calcite plates is associated with the ammonoids shell. Very important, especially the ones that are preserved in Mesozoic rocks. Now the shell form and mode of life of the fossil ammonoids. Uh, the first is uh, the Ditoliocerus, that is the Dactyloceras, which has an evolute shell with wide umbilicals and an oversection. Then they have an ammonitic suture line and they are posthumous and they mostly occur in Jurassic rocks. The, gonatic, uh, the gonatites, which are almost uh, entirely spherical with evolute shells, and they contain a depression that is a re on their wool section. Then they have a wide re especially on the dorsal side. They have a small umbilicals, and they have gonatitic suture lines. They, have faint, they are faintly ornamented, and they float on shallow uh, at shallow depth, meaning that they are they adopt a pelagic uh, uh, kind of mode of life, and they are common in Paleozoic rocks. That is how they appear. This is uh, an ornament, the suture, and then the umbilicals, and then you have the aperture. That is how they appear in drawing position. You have the ceratites. The ceratites are relatively compressed and they have an evolute shell. They have a relatively large umbilicals and they have a serratitic suture line. They are also floaters. So they adopt a floating mode of life and are very common in pemotriasic rocks. That is how their structure looks like. You have the aperture, you have equally the umbilicals, you have the suture, in their shell forms. We have the Ozyctopidoceras, which has a compressed envelope shell, and they have a relatively large umbilicus, with the O section having a deep re especially on the dorsal side. They have an ammonitic suture, uh, suture lines, and they, have better, they are better swimmers than the most they occur in lower Jurassic rocks or formations. That is how they appear in their uh, drawing position. They have suture, umbilicals, and they have the aperture, and this is the center of buoyancy, always indicated. Very important. Then the geological history of ammonoids. Ammonoids separated from the natuloids at the Devonian, and they became extinct by the end of the Triassic. Also, the Paleozoic ammonoids 
are gonadetic. Or they are mostly gonadites with gonadetic suture lines. Then they survive right up to the Permian period. And then there are possible reasons we can use or which are used or which advance the reason for which ammonites are used in correlation. The first of which is the fact that they are well preserved and they are very common. They are also easily distinguished. And they occur in different sedimentary rock types and they occur widely, meaning that they, they merit or they pass the conditions that are uh, that will cause them to be either zone or index fossils, which are best used for correlation in stratigraphy. We have the subclass colloida or belemnoida. That is their structure. This structure is commonly, it looks like a cigar, a cigar shape. That is the full structure of belemnite. The morphology of belemnite. They are, they are extinct cephalopods, and their shell is uh, having a phragmocone. They have a solid calcareous gut, and they look like a cigar. Their shell is cigar-like in shape. And then their posterior end has an oval protoconch, and the anterior end forms the pro the, the proostracum. The pro then they have a saucer-like uh, scepter. And they have a, 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 a siphuncle, which is found in the ventral margin, as well as they have a streamlined shell, which makes them very good swimmers. They are very common in Cretaceous rocks. Then, in their geological history, Belemnite first appeared in Upper uh, Carboniferous rocks, and then they are very, very, very important as zone fossils because they have a wide geographic distribution and even and easily identify through their gut. At the beginning of our lesson, we evoked a problem situation. We were wondering how the petroleum engineer had to notice the many types of fossil shells as well as organic traces. And we have some responses, which we are going to now see which of them is possible. The first one was that he used the effect of denudational agents on the fossils. We say no to this uh, response because denudational agents like running water, wave action, wind action, ice action, gravity action will help destroy fossils and not preserve them. They are. Uh, he could have also used or applied the idea of gaps in fossil records. But gaps in fossil records will not help you to know if uh, fossils occur as traces or as uh, their shells. So the response is not also accepted. Now, the third one was the fact that he used the morphological and ecological aspects of the fossil. We say yes, because throughout, we have been using morphological and ecolog ecological aspects of fossils to identify them into different classes and phyla. So, summarily, we are saying that class Cephalopoda has three subclasses, which are Natoloida, which is Upper uh, Cambrian to Recent. And then we have Ammonoida and we have Colloida, which are most likely called Belimnites, which appear in Upper Carboniferous to Eocene rocks. <laughs> Now, in our exercise, we study the fossil drawings below. You have fossil A, you have fossil B, and you have fossil C. We look at it, it is lettered, and we are going to identify what those letters are. Referring to the fossils A, B, and C above, label the features T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. If we go back to the fossil, and we reflect at the different letters, then we realize that letter T stands for reentrant, letter U stands for ornament, letter V will stand for suture, letter W for aperture, letter X for the center of buoyancy, and then letter Y for the umbilicus, then letter Z for the center of 
gravity. Now, after having gone through our lesson, we shall now take an assignment, which we will do at home. Now, we are going to use the different aspects of the fossil, uh, uh, the fossil generals that fall under the class cephalopoda to answer this question. The question is as follows. State and briefly describe the main groups of mature ammonites based on the nature of suture lines. You are going to add diagrammatic illustrations. We have come to the end of our lesson. Our next lesson will be on description of fossil steel, but we shall focus on class gastropoda. See you in our next lesson. <laughs> On a tege minga, matege nyum, on a tege majang, matege ndom, mane tambia ninya ne injubiayen, gani bana, matege mot, gani la kiri watege ndong, esotina, biadinkido, mane tambia ninya.